Pastor William Andrew Curlew is a legend in the eyes of people whose lives he's touched all over the world. He has been in ministry since 1952, and on November 29, 2020, he turned 100 years old. He has been married to the former Sylvia Joy Levy for 63 years, and they have six children, Therese, Conrad, Topaz, Jeremy, Hugh, and Mary all of whom are successful members of society in their own right. Pastor Curlew's life's work has demonstrated four outstanding characteristics, vision, commitment, courage, and sacrifice. His story needs to be told because his story is our history. Curlew's stamp, Curlew's mark, has been made in the history of the movement of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Jamaica, in the United States, in Florida Conference in particular. His story is our history. One Sunday evening, I came in from church and my godfather gave me a hymn book and a Bible. And, you know, I, I, a quiet Sunday evening, and I began to sing and I read from the hymn book. And she came and she told me that I am born for a spiritual purpose. God told her before I was born that she was going to have a son and I should be a preacher. But I wasn't sober enough for that. <laughs> and eventually, at 23, I felt that I need a better life. I began to pray. A guy, I went to Kingston with my auntie. And a guy brought a track and he left it at the home. When he left it, I wasn't there. I was, I think they sent me to pick up groceries somewhere or the other. And when I came back, I saw the track. And my cousin, was my auntie's daughter, she gave me the track. And I began to read it. It was about the millennium. And I asked her where she got it from. It's a little man from the Adventist Church left this track here. And um, the next week, the guy came back to find out if anybody read the track. And my cousin said, yes. My cousin Willie read it. And he called me and began to talk to me and invited me to church. So I told him, I don't have what to to go to church. <laughs> and my auntie was inside the room and she heard. And when the man was gone, he said, Willie, why, why you told him on a lie? You came from country and you have nice church suits. He said, you, you should should have gone to church and visit. You may meet some body there, can get a nice job. Because previous to that, before I came to Kingston, I used to do bookkeeping. But I left that job and then I was seeking the Lord and the Lord directed me to Kingston. And this guy came into my life and um, he invited me to church and I went with him and I sat for the, in the preparation for the meeting. The next Sabbath, they were fasting. First in my life, I started a fast. I read anything that day and they started the meeting the Sunday that was and I never miss one night for nearly three months. I 
So I was curious who was this Kurdu. <laughs> so I asked uh, Sunshine, my cousin, and she said, and we saw him going along the, the, the breezeway there. Uh, <laughs> and I, I said, I just, that little skinny fellow with the long neck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so, um, so he, um, during the service, um, there was a part near to the, um, the rostrum behind with a curtain that people could sit. <coughs> And so I was holding Roger because, you know, he was sort of making a little noise. And I looked over and I saw him staring at me. And so when I saw him, he smiled and bowed his head. Okay. And now, she returned it. They were having, they were having an <laughs> ordination of, of pastors in the afternoon. And so they made the, the announcement that the first three benches are for the wives of the ordained ministers. Mm -hmm. So if you're not a wife of an ordained minister, don't sit in it. So we came later as usual, and he was ushering. So mm -hmm. he took us to the last bench. I, I said, we're not sitting here because we heard the announcement. And then he said, why are you running away from it? <laughs> and so after that prophetic <laughs> for the weekend <laughs> it was a whirlwind <laughs> everybody went off talking to each other and left us mm -hmm. and then i found out that most of my friends were his friends but i came from the east and he came from the west wise man we never we never met after six months he asked me to marry him and i told him not yet it's too early and so I, I, I gave another few months down and he said, that's too late. <laughs> <laughs> so we compromised on, on, on March. Mm -hmm. And so it was, uh, it was eight months uh, courting. Eight months, yes. We encouraged each other and I, I know in all of this that he was a, a praying person. I, I saw him on his knees by himself and uh, I, I saw the, the things that he did for other people, the interest that he, he took in them and the, the love of, of people and uh, the sacrifices that, that he made. And I encouraged him making those sacrifices. So I cheered him on, I wept with him, I prayed with him, I mm. laughed with him. And uh, laughter was a very big part of our house. Mm -hmm. we, we could find something humorous in anything that happened. And, uh, when these children come home, it's, it's like a, a sitcom. Should come. <laughs> <laughs> I want to think that she's a gift from the Lord. I always pray to get a Christian woman and a bright woman. My philosophy was, if my wife is, is even brighter than me, it's okay. <laughs> I, I don't spell very well. <laughs> I don't spell it very well. So she would spell a word for me. <laughs> and when she wants to remember a telephone number, I go at numbers. You I can tell all her. the numbers. And then I'm, I'm a spell check. <laughs> my, wife is, my wife is more than a wife. She's like a secretary. And she organized the bills I have. And sometimes some things I have not remember. She know where to find it and you know. Uh, very good. And if a telephone call comes in and it's something I will attend to. And if she a uh, common sense will say, okay, why not this one so? Otherwise she say, wait until the pastor come, you know? 
So I have such a confidence in her. And um, I always consider her a gift from the Lord. You know, my mother and father, they were very loving. My daddy didn't talk much, but he was tender and kind to my mother. My mother does all the talking. <laughs> and he was lazy to talk like our Jeremy sometimes. We just didn't you know, say anything, you know? And, but when I get him going, he will go. My daddy was like that. And um, I, I always appreciate her as a fitting wife. When I get married, I'm going to do everything to make her happy. And I live up to that. The kids were getting big and it was time for college and um, we felt America had more opportunities for them exposed to. So we settled in Miami. When we came we had no job and um, the Southeast Conference offer us a job that I could go and teach. I want to teach a school in grade, so I said, I will be a misfit. I can't do that. I said, I've been trained as a pastor. And um, the, the wonder, wonder what to do. And I knelt down and I prayed to the Lord. I said, Lord, you called me to the ministry. In Jamaica, you bless me. And in America, a lot of our people up here, please give me a ministry. Because William Gurlew decided to take five children to Andrews University without any bursary, substance, or financial support was just mother working as an RN at night. So life became interesting. And that interesting piece meant that each of us had duties and responsibilities. Each of us had to become independent enough to care for each other. But most importantly, for the first time, we learned what it was to go to a special store that Andrews University had where we would get secondhand warm clothing and things that we've never had to do before. In hindsight, then we did not know how significant it was for William A. Curlew to take the five kids, even though everyone said, why are you taking them? Are you rich? And his comments were always, I'm rich in faith. In, in Jamaica, in the early 70s, there was a political upheaval taking place wherein the government was experimenting with what is called democratic socialism. And there's a lot of folks who started to leave Jamaica. And of course, they were coming to, to Florida. And as they arrive in Florida, they seek out the church based on the area that I was attending. One Sabbath, and this now, listen now, they're talking about 1976. So a few years passed. Uh, I was in church and I saw a family came. And it was a little man, his wife, and four young children. And uh, of course, they worshiped there. And then uh, I went and I greeted them. I, I, you, you follow me? And he, I mean, he tell me his name is Pastor Curlew. I was so glad to meet, meet him, excited. So the Maranatha Church is located uh, in Miami Gardens, Florida, uh, maybe a few blocks away from the Hard Rock Stadium. Uh, it is a predominantly West Indian church, um, but in a, located in a black American community, a community made up of uh, black Americans and Hispanics. I think it used to be predominantly white at one stage. 
but now it's predominantly black Americans, Hispanics. Actually, I heard about William Curl years ago, you know, um, at a different church. My, my cousins go to the Lord Hill Church. And at the time, I was visiting there and heard them talking about Pastor Curlew, Pastor Curlew, Pastor Curlew. And, but I never met him until I actually came here uh, two years ago. But what I heard of him was this man who uh, is just planting churches everywhere in, in South Florida. Uh, and when I met him and when I came here, I actually found out how many those were. I think it's about maybe 11 to 13 churches that came out of this one church alone. Uh, just, just phenomenal, really. In 1980, that's when I met Pastor Curry. We were actually at a friend's home. And he came by and told me that he heard that I am from Jamaica and I'm a teacher. And he needs a teacher for the preschool. So I came here in 1980, December of 1980, and took over the preschool. At the time, we had no zoning and we had no license. But Pastor Curlew worked so hard and he was always so hands-on. He never left it up to me to say, okay, Sister Brown, you need a license. He was there with us every step of the way. What, what, one of Pastor Curlew's functions mm -hmm. that he did was to help people, always. You know, people coming from the Caribbean, mm -hmm. they're coming here, they're starting a new life here, especially our pastors, young pastors from Jamaica. It was always his desire to help them to start here to get uh, hired by the Florida Conference or the Southeastern Conference, or what have you, and to get them a job. And most of the times to do that, what he did was that he knew of areas where the population density was pretty high, but there was no churches there. There's mm -hmm. no gospel going out there. So he would strategize and say, well, okay, uh, board, we think we need to start a church. We have enough people now. We need to start a church in this area. And so, for example, like Norland, we got to go into Norland and start a church. He was a and man of they, vision. Yeah. Oh my goodness. And then they put it together and then they send the people out and they send that pastor out. So after that pastor started a church, when it becomes a church, then he's the first pastor to serve for that church. And if the, if the conference office is going to come in to organize it into a church, then naturally they're going to hire that pastor, mm -hmm. and so that pastor gets a start, and they're moving on. Uh, my mother was a member of Maranatha Church, and uh, she has been a member for many years, and she, she's always invited me to church, and I've always visited the church, but I usually go to Sunday church. But Pastor Curl, who visited my home very often, and especially when my mother became a homebound member, as she got blind and she was home and he came, he would come very often to visit. And every time, you know, he would give me some words of encouraging me to come to the church. And I decided that, you know what, I heard he was coming, so I was just gonna hide, <laughs> okay? Because, you know, I got tired of him asking me to come all the time. So um, I was going to hide, but guess what happened? I bumped right into Pastor Curlew. He was gone. <laughs> And that was the beginning of something. First he said to me, Mrs. Bins, the Lord is calling you. And when that man says something, trust me, it's going to happen. So Pastor Curlew was my parents' pastor in Jamaica years ago. At that time, he pastored in then West Jamaica Conference, which um, covered the western side of the island of Jamaica, but he was in charge specifically of the parish of Trelawney. So um, right now, the district that we're originally from in Jamaica has about uh, maybe eight churches, but he was in charge of an entire parish, which is very large. So he may have had maybe a hundred or more churches. That's how uh, significant it was. So um, when I ended up here at Maranatha and I told my parents about Maranatha and that it was started by Curlew. Their first question was, is he still alive? <laughs> uh, 
And that was in 2008 when I became an associate here. So the first time I met him was at a evangelistic series here. And I guess it was only fitting because he's one who is big on evangelism and will tell you that, you know, that is a lifeblood of the church. And um, my first impression was like, this man is very short. You know, I, 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 I've heard so much about him, so I was expecting to see someone of tall stature and a deep voice and, you know, command and presence. Not that it, that's not there in terms of his presence, but I'm like, wow, this is a little man. It's a little man, but clearly he has made a big impact because um, my parents remember him clearly. And what is amazing, when he found out that I was from Trelawney, he started to tell me about um, the churches that he pastored, including my home church. And um, at that time, uh, so that's what, 2009, 2008, 2009, I think it was, because I think that was my first evangelistic series here at Maranatha. And at that time, that's how many years ago, he was still not a young man, but he was vividly recalling and uh, re uh, reproducing names of individuals and telling me stories. And I'm like, wow, interesting. So you remember, and the stories I've heard of you are true. Yeah. Growing up, my dad used to always use the phrase, when there's no vision, the people perish. And as kids, we used to wonder, what does he mean? There's no vision, the people perish. And as I watched him throughout his career, looking at the situation that he was in, planning ahead, two years, three years, five years, for where we, you currently are, what is your current situation, and where could you be, or where could you advance to improve the situation. And so one example was when we were building Maranatha, and the membership was about 50 people. And I remember him wanting to have a church that could hold hundreds of people. He wanted a school. He wanted a college, a university, a hospital. And people would say, that's ridiculous. There's no way you can achieve that. And he had the faith, he had the vision, he worked towards it. A very large church was built, multiple churches came from that. There was a daycare center, there was a school that was built. And so that taught me in life, you know, the past 35 years being in business and looking at leadership, those were one of the important lessons that I learned. That vision is important. As a leader, you need to look forward, plan ahead, and not just live with the status quo and maintain that status quo. I heard about Pastor Curlew long before I've ever met him. And the, the number one thing I heard was, Pastor Curlew is somebody who is not afraid to rock the, the status quo of the conference or, or, or to, to ensure that there is equity and everybody get a fair share of whatever is happening. Okay, I became principal 2019 and um, the students there, I would tell them about the person who pioneered this building, the, the school um, that they are part of, but he's no longer living in this area, but he's around. And when we had a special day, I remember last year, we had education day and Pastor Curlew came. And uh, the students at that time got a chance to meet him. And um, personally, I remember the prayer he prayed because I was being installed as the new principal. And I've never ever felt such fervent prayer from somebody. It's like God came down when he spoke to God on my behalf and I could, felt, I could feel his presence. That was a very special moment when he prayed and after that he, uh, he, he talked to me about the school, how the kids are doing, but the kids are aware. aware. Even just this past week um, when we were telling them about his centenary um, celebration, uh, we, I gave, we gave them a little bit of the history of the, uh, of the school how it came about and why it was named after Pastor Willemi Curlew. It was in the mid-1970s. I was a 15-year-old student at um, Harrison Memorial High School. And um, I met him when he showed up in the mornings to let his children off at the same school. I never got close to him. I just saw him and his children and his older son, Conrad Curlew, who happens to share my name, was a student, a, a classmate of mine. We were in the same class and some teacher, I don't know if Conrad would remember this, 
but some teachers would refer to us as Conrad number one or Conrad number two. <laughs> and uh, I don't remember who was, who was the number one, but um, we were distinguished mostly by our surnames, Curlew or Duncan. And so um, that's how I met Pastor Curlew, through his, his son, that's a, a classmate of mine. We never talked. I don't think he knew me because I was one of 500, 600 students. And, um, but from a distance, I knew him as the father of my classmate. Six, I got a phone call from the president of the Ontario Conference offering me a position in that conference to serve as a pastor in East Toronto. Mm -hmm. He sent me a plane ticket, and then I flew out to Canada. And then um, all the protocols for immigration was done, mm -hmm. and I was just waiting to take up my new position as pastor uh, you know, in that conference. In the meantime, I was getting calls from Miami, Florida. And uh, among the things that were said, I remember Pastor Curley said, you know, it's, it's cold in Canada. <laughs> and when the cold uh, begins to bite you, you are going to want to come to Miami. <laughs> but I said, I have a job. He said, no, you need to come here because you see how I had an agenda. Not just for me to serve the church, but for my wife to serve the school. Mm -hmm. Because my wife was a first class teacher and, um, you know, a, a educator, an administrator. And um, so all of these things were in the package while Pastor Curlew was speaking with me and encouraging me to come. But I said, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bushes. Mm -hmm. So I said to him, but you know, I have a job here and he would still insist. But you know, God has a way of turning things around. The first time I heard about Pastor Curlew, I was a teenager grow, uh, growing up in Miami. And I tell you how that was. We were competing with the drone trims. And uh, Maranatha, had, they always won. They were good <laughs> at the time. I'm, I'm, I assume they're good today too. And then we were trying to put together a drum team um, from um, Hialeah Church and also Ebenezer and uh, and we learned that we needed to uh, get better at it because we were competing with uh, Maranatha and the the pathfinders there. Pastor Curlew says many times including around two years ago when we had the mortgage burning right here that I said to him that come and let us form our own church I am not certain I said that or he said that, but it came up in the discussion. He said, I said that. That's where the idea came to start the Maranatha Church. Quite a few Caribbean folks were here and a group got together now, he called. And we started to worship at somebody's house in a place called Norla, not far from here. Matter of fact, it was a basement that's the only place in South Florida that has a basement. Somebody owns a basement and they allow us to use the basement. And that's where we started to worship. The sins and the wrongs they committed treating you uh, so badly. Now please forgive the sins of... The I go to the church and they wouldn't allow me to teach a class. And one of the pastors asked who recruited him these blacks. The following week though, the following week, uh, something took place that was going to radicalize and change everything. He said the new pastor pulled him in the office this morning and said to him that there's a prob serious problem in the church because the members are uncomfortable with so many Jamaicans coming in. And his, resp his job is to tell them not to come to that church. They must get and go to the other churches. Too many of them come in. So what was the question? And the president, and I'm going to tell you the name of the president. And he said, tell me to sit down and shut up. And I said, don't tell me to do that. 
I was mad. And he sat down and everybody went quiet. And then um, I blew things off my mind and I don't keep it up. And when I went home the night, I left them and it seems as if the rest of the committee told him what he did was not right. And he called me on the phone and I was crying and said, Bill, Bill, please, please forgive me. I say, you are forgiven. And we go on. When they saw that we were building up congregations of blacks, that never troubled them because we were by ourselves. But they didn't want the blacks to mix with the white because when the blacks come and mix with the white, the whites leave the church, you know? But I never make that bother me because I was working with my people. I was working with black people and I found they wanted me and I wanted them. In every step of the way, we had great challenge. Initially, when they started to compensate Pastor Curlew, he was getting just 50% of what the, the, the regular pastors. Literally, the board, a few of us, make a request that, we, that he needs to be compensated because we kind of knew the formula that was used to, you know, uh, to compensate pastors. And they says, but, but, uh, we, like, we're not, we don't, we can't do that. They, they, I said, you can because of the formula. And of course, uh, Pastor Curl, I think around two or three weeks after Pastor Curl called me, I said they decided to give him full salary. There's always tension, and there is always a fight for immigrants and for those that come to um, this beautiful land of freedom and opportunity to find uh, the space to be uh, recognized, to, to be supported with uh, resources and pastors, right? Um, sometimes we have one pastor for three, four, five congregations um, because they are new congregations. They, they, are, they don't have the resources. And in the South, I remember when Pastor Curlew started becoming the voice for the immigrants. Um, I remember we, we had um, big churches like Miami Temple and uh, Miami Springs and, and, and other churches, um, but there, was n there wasn't that emphasis on the smaller congregations, so the, the immigrant congregations that were forming in the South. Um, as a Hispanic, I have to say thank you to Pastor Curlew for this reason. Um, sometimes the Hispanic pastors in the South couldn't communicate their needs and desires and dreams. Uh, and they found in Pastor Curlew that voice. Uh, we're talking about almost 25,000, 30,000 members that live in the South. Many of those members don't know who Pastor Curlew is. And the benefits and the blessings that they enjoy today, they have no idea of the struggles and the fight and the voice that Pastor Curlew raised in order for the church to be what the church is today in the South. And not only in the South, this is, this is important that I say it, everywhere you go. The church became um, quite big. That was the only congregation we ever see there are more men than women. And so in the meantime, the, the people in, in Lauder Hill, we couldn't hold them in that little church. And so the, the board said, okay, uh, find a place in Lauder Hill where you can worship there and we will still take care of you. So on one Sabbath, Lauder Hill was, was organized 
and in the morning and in the afternoon, the Haitian church was organized. And, it, and we, got a, we got a pastor for the Haitian church and we got a pastor for the for Lord Hill Church. So uh, what, what was happening is that like every year there was a new church organized and, and then there's a new pastor until one of these days they, they said, people in the conference said, when did this happen? <laughs> because there were so many black churches, we just didn't have one Haitian church. We had several Haitian churches. He doesn't view the work of God as a job. He views it as a calling. Hence the title of this documentary, <laughs> The Calling. He views it as a calling. He says that he has never encountered anything that God cannot accomplish. And when he believes that God has set it on a path to accomplishing a certain endeavor, his faith is such of a profound nature that nothing, absolutely nothing, will stand in his way in the accomplishing of that task. Churches and organizations uh, in general tend to take on the personality of the leader. And Maranatha is, is no different. I think he spent 23 years here. So really the church Maranatha is synonymous with the name William Curlew. And uh, the person he is, is, is someone who is very strong on, on relationships. Um, he is a leader who is both authoritative and very influential in terms of his, his style of leadership with the people. So he's someone who gets, gets really close. He has the personal touch, but he is also a great administrator. Both those elements are very strong in the church. When we think about uh, pastoral leadership, uh, there are uh, what five pastoral roles. So there's uh, preaching, teaching, evangelism, pastoral care and counseling, and, and administration. Uh, some of the marks that are clearly left here, which are qualities that he has, is the church is a very well-structured church. So it, it, it gives the impression of somebody who was here who had very strong administrative skills. And the church is very, very big on pastoral care. If as a pastor in this church, you're not uh, passionate about pastoral care, it's, it's really hard to, to do well and bond with the people here. Uh, they're big on those two things, structure, or pastoral care, and those are things, that are, those are qualities that he clearly, clearly had. He, he takes care of people. Now, one of the things Gurlow said to me, which was very interesting, is that, um, and I guess that was possible back in the days, or back in the days, he helped so many people um, in terms of getting their stay in this country, in terms of finding a place to live, in terms of, and, and, and I'm not talking about, you know, short-term help. I'm talking about life-changing help, where people, for example, who had been here possibly legally couldn't um, get their papers. He worked with people to get that done. Um, another way we see his legacy also outside of helping people is that he is a multiplier. There's so many churches that came out of this church here. Eden, for example, um, Tabernacle, those were two of the main, first main churches. He, he told me about those at length. Um, so, and then out of those and others, you have so many other churches that have developed, daughter churches, you know? So his, his legacy is just so evident and its impact and residues of it just because of these things, evangelism, pastoral care, his ability to help people and um, groom people for leadership and things of that nature. Uh, you know, I believe, I believe that he was the first pastor of color, my color, 
outside of, of, of North America to have been invited to work here in the Florida Conference as a full-time pastor. But then I learned that it was after a few years of struggles to really get, get in. And during that time, he started his own ministry out there, you know, um, working as a bona fide Seventh-day Adventist pastor with Caribbean folk and growing this church that became the Maranatha Church. So not only was he the first pastor to have been employed by the Florida Conference at that time, but then he was the founder of this Maranatha Church that grew into a, 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 a large, powerful, wonderful, successful church family. And that's what made it possible for a worker like me to get a place in the work um, in this conference at that time. Well, of course, by the time I got here, there were many, many more of my own folk that were already employed. But then he is the genesis of the Caribbean work in, in this conference. So one of the ways that my dad advocated for me in the background was uh, he got me a job. So I was at Southern University and previous year as a good Jamaican, you have to work. And I worked in fast food and I was not looking forward to another fast food job. So I mentioned to my father on one of the weekly calls and uh, about two weeks later, he called and said, I got you a job at Camp Kalaku. I said, but I didn't apply. He said, well, no, I went to them and I said, you know, my son, he is at Southern. He's a good student. He went to Greater Miami Academy. He needs a job. And they said, well, we really don't have any positions. And he's like, uh, I'm sure that you can find a pastor's son a job. So he called a few people higher up. And a few days later, they called him back and said, we have a position for him. Um, and it turned out, that I was the first African-American counselor at Camp Kalakwa, which is a youth camp uh, for Florida Conference, where from seven to 16-year-olds uh, come every summer. Uh, and I was one of the counselors in the cabin providing guidance and leadership for them and uh, turned out to be the first African-American counselor that they had. God used Pastor Curlew. God used Pastor Curlew mm -hmm. to insist and he would call me almost every day to say, what are you doing? Remember, you need to come. We so need you your wife for the school. You must be a pig in the China shop. Yes, we need, to, we need you for the church. We need you to come. He would not stop. When God wants a man, he uses whatever means necessary to influence a man, to put him where he wants him to be. And this is how I view it right now, because God, God in control. I remember, I remember that afterwards, Pastor Curlew told us not at the time, mm -hmm. that he had seen him in a dream. Wow. That's another aspect of Pastor Curlew's journey. Pastor Curlew was a dreamer that turned the dreams into his visions. Yes. Pastor Curlew saw him in a dream succeeding him. Now there were other people who were after succeeding Pastor Curlew. That was a big deal, apparently. And, but Pastor Curlew saw him and he was like, his statue, he just saw his statue in his dream. Huh? And so that was driving him but we were not aware of we that. We didn't know. We did not know that at all. So yes, I used to drive his taking car. Taking me to school every day. Yes, he was the one taking us back and forth. What a man with a big heart. Mm -hmm. A giant of a man. A visionary. A kind-hearted man. That's who he was. My father does not use an alarm clock, but the Holy Spirit wakes him up between 3 and 4 a.m. every morning. And he wakes up Wherever he is, even if he's traveling, he goes and he finds a quiet spot. When he's at home, he has a chair that he will sit in and he prays every morning to God. He reads and then he sits quietly and gets instructions and directions from God. That communication, the secret to his success is not power, is not, yes, he's courageous, but that's how, where he gets his courage from. His strength comes directly from a ongoing personal daily relationship with Jesus where he is getting directions each and every day. I see Pastor Curlew as Moses rescuing the children of Israel. And he was rescuing us. We needed a leader 
and he was the right leader sent by God at the right time. I love Pastor Curlew. He was there for us. And uh, a matter of fact, I remember I called Pastor Curlew one night and I meet with him. I says, are you certain we are doing the right thing? <laughs> and he said, yes. And he said, you continue to stick with me. You, 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 you follow me? And I did. You know, I remember when we were even supposed to, to buy this property, that some of them who had left, they were kind of mocking us, saying, yeah, I'm them gone to Carl City. This is place is called Miami Gardens, right? Carl City, you know, to buy. And I raised that issue with Pastor Curlew. I says, Pastor Curlew tells me something that resonates in my mind up to today, and I use it all the time, even at the con because I serve in a conference at the union level. I, 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 I share it with them. He said to me, he said, Brother Allen, let me tell you something. He says, church transform communities. Communities does not transform church. I'll never forget that. One of the things I admire about my father is that once he got it in his mind that he could do something, he was fearless in pursuing it. He was utterly convic convinced or convicted that he could pull it off, and he did. And, um, you know, I learned from him that if you really have a, a goal or you have a dream and it's something that you want badly, um, to summon that courage um, to go out and get it done. And by seeing him do this, um, it was very inspiring to, to me and I think all of us as, as children growing up. It was never easy and this man is just fearless. Um, he has stood in front of conference officials and just, and he, here's the interesting thing about Curlew. He's not malicious. He's just, it, it's, it's righteous indignation. That's what it is, because I recall, for example, he and his wife were telling me about one camp meeting they attended, and um, apparently back in those days, they used to do blackface. And he's like, listen, no. And he challenged that, and they stopped that. Um, I remember when they are trying, he told me about when they are trying to build this place and how they made, it was a lot of difficulties just to get funding for it and so forth, but he never backed down. You know, he was fearless and at the same time not abrasive, um, at least not in a diabolic way or anything like that. So I, I think what we need to understand as ministers, especially in these days, is one, you have to know that God is leading you because that's one of the things Curlew often talks about. He'll tell you about the dreams he had and that confirmed that, you know what, this is the direction in which God wanted him to go. So he was very connected to God, a man of prayer. So, and to be fearless like that, you definitely need that connection with God and you have to be a man of prayer. As younger ministers, that's something we need. We need to have such a connection with God that, you know, we will fearlessly challenge the status quo as needs be. Praise the Lord for what we are today. And we pray and we commit that we need to continue that work. We need to continue that legacy. And we need to continue fighting for those that are in need, looking for opportunities for representation, looking for ways to be one family, the family of God. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter your culture. It doesn't matter. We are children of God. I am aware that I am called to win people to Christ, and, and that's my, my major. And I believe not only preaching verbally to people, but treating people kindly and, and have them loving you. And one of the ways to have people loving you is to show interest in them. And we did a lot of that. I like, as a pastor, to see people being helped. There are some people I don't remember giving them a Bible study, but they would come to church and they would say, Pastor Curl, I want to get baptized. And when I traced, I said, well, a friend invite them and they like what is happening at the church and I visit them and things like that. 
and we develop a relationship. I want to go to the doctor, my car. I, they want a carpenter or somebody, I know where they can get one, you know? So that was the kind of ministry that I wage. He will go down in history as a pioneer who courageously carved paths that have benefited thousands of lives. His legacy is a towering example of service to humanity. It includes immense and exemplary standards in leadership, church planting, discipleship, and evangelism. As a result, the work of God in Jamaica and the United States of America has gained tremendous ground because of the visionary leadership of Pastor Dr. William A. Curlew. I, I cherish this thought that it's better to see a sermon and to hear one. Yeah. I'm thinking about a journey Soaring through the stars Flying past Orion Jupiter and Mars Ooh, yeah I'm thinking about a city Where I won't have to cry no more Oh, what a celebration when I finally reach the other shore But I don't need a mansion I'm not worried about the streets of gold oh, Just let me talk to Jesus The one who died to save my soul Only yeah. Talk to mama Shout about the love of Christ